What's up, everybody? It's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. And on this channel, we break down the trials and cases you care most about so you can understand how the American civil and criminal justice system works. And we try to make sure you understand what your rights are in every situation, which is why we try to walk you through the entire legal process while also answering your insightful questions along the way. And while it's not legal advice, it's always exciting. So buckle up for another episode of The Lawyer You Know. What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another episode. And as another day passes, more information comes out about the Idaho 4 case, about Brian Koberger. And today we're going to go through a few of the new details about Ann Taylor and how she didn't just represent Kernodal's mother on one charge. We're going to talk about how close Brian Koberger actually got to working for law enforcement, and maybe he even did. And then a little more background that is sad about Kaylee Gonsalves, one of the victims in this case. I appreciate you joining me, talking about this case, sending me these questions and these tidbits that are coming out on Instagram and Twitter, at Tragos Law is how you can find me on there. Uh, Brian Etten, who's been on this case from the jump, his, he is a very reliable source, which is why I feel comfortable talking about some of this stuff if he's reporting that it is true. Um, we're going to watch a video uh, of him discussing this with a reporter or with a news station, and we will react to it, talk about how it could affect the case, uh, talk about conflict a little bit more and whether this changes the fact that Ann Taylor should or should not represent Brian Koberger in this case. So let's get into this together. If you haven't, hit that like button, please, and subscribe to our page for continued coverage here of this case and many others. Uh, hopefully you were able to catch Pete's breakdown of the Elizabeth Holmes potential fleeing, um, as the prosecutors have said, and then also coverage of the Murdaugh trial every night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. But let's watch this uh, interview together to see what's new on this case and see how it will affect the case legally. Slide. Uh, to be a research assistant with the Pullman, Washington Police Department uh, and didn't just apply, but even had some kind of virtual interview with the chief. Uh, and we've been able to obtain uh, one of the emails uh, that that he wrote to the chief. Um, so before we get to the email, he not only applied, but he had a virtual interview with the chief. Imagine being that chief. You interviewed this person. You were considering him. And you'll see we don't know whether or not he got the job, but how close he was in consideration to getting this internship and then knowing now what he's accused of. And, and we're also going to pay close attention to the people in this interview and the words and verbiage that they use and why we disagree with it. And I don't blame them for it because it's hard to not get swept up in this. But on this channel, we make sure that we use appropriate words. And when we don't, you guys catch it in the chat. So make sure in the comments you catch and pick up with when they say something that we don't necessarily agree with and how they categorize this. And it, I want to read it to you. It says, Chief Jenkins, it was a great pleasure to meet with you today and share my thoughts and excitement regarding the research assistantship for public safety. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Uh, best. Okay. So listen, context is everything and how you read everything um, and what context you read it makes a huge difference. So this was on April 12th of 2022, about seven months before the crimes were committed. It was a great pleasure to meet with you today and share my thoughts and excitement regarding the research assistance of public safety. If you read that as like a normal kid in a PhD program um, who is studying criminology, is studying this research, this would be a great opportunity for them. Some people even said he had to do some kind of internship, internship to get his PhD. It seems totally normal, respectful, adult, polite, professional. But if you read it in the context of you think this guy is going to become a murderer in six months... And he's already potentially planning this based on how far back the 12 visits to the house uh, with his phone pinging goes. It's pretty creepy and pretty eerie. Regards, Brian, he applied. And if they find that this was all part of his plan to stalk or prepare or um, take a look at and stake out around this house and figure out the best way to do this and the best way to cover up his crime, then you could absolutely see this email as a piece of evidence in the case, if they can connect it and if it is relevant. Or you could see the defense use it and say, this is not a guy that is a criminal. This is a guy that wanted to work for law enforcement. So either side could potentially use an email like this as evidence. 
for this internship for fall 2022. Obviously, just very, very strange to think about what we know now. The fact that he was having these intimate meetings with the police department, emailing the police chief, uh, and, and then the way everything turned out. So what we know now and the way everything turned out. Well, how did everything turn out? And I don't blame Brian. He's a champion at this and he's amazing and given us so much solid information. But just the discussion around this case is how this is how it turned out. And look what we know now. We know Brian Koberger did this and he didn't say that, but that's kind of what it sounds like. And we got to be careful that we're not saying things like that, right? And if it's true, it would be eerie to read these words. That's kind of, you know, the, the way I would couch it. I don't blame him for this at all. Just kind of another point of discussion to make sure how we're looking at this case, because this is going to go on for a while and these tidbits are going to keep coming out and we cannot let them stack up and crush his presumption of innocence. We've got to be careful of that in our criminal justice system here in America. I mean, uh, you know, fall 2022 is exactly when the murders happened, November 13th. That's just mm. unbelievable. But so here's the $64,000 question. Did he get the job? Did he, I know he was a high, highly ranked candidate. Like, I don't know, one of the top 10 or so, right? Yeah, it's a good question. We don't know. We don't know whether he got the job or, you know, where this went from wow. there. Uh I think that's potentially relevant, whether or not he got the job. So I think we will find that out eventually. Uh, we, we just don't know. But what I can tell you is it is that very police department that was out there as part of the search uh, at his apartment right there in Pullman when they pulled all that stuff out uh, after he was arrested for the murders. And I'm looking at this. He was actually not one of 10. He was one of four finalists. He was really in the running. But I got to find out if he got that job. And then all of a sudden just, you know, disappeared because, you know, he was arrested. All right. So the next question is the one about Kaylee Gonzalez being a true crime fan and having interaction mm. with the very police department that, you know, is, is investigating her case. So she was a true crime fan. And he was a criminology expert. Everybody's saying, you know, masters, PhD. Could they have met on a true crime forum? Could they have met on a YouTube page? Like, I mean, the theories are going to spread from this tidbit. That's why this tidbit matters because people are going to talk about it. And we are still looking for some kind of actual solid connection between the suspect and the victims. This is another potential connection. Is it confirmed? No, no way. People are going to speculate. People are going to talk about it. But we are looking for potential connections, potential motive. And if it is a connection and it does point to motive, then it could become evidence at the trial. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah, this is sad. You mentioned it. We've, know, we, we've heard from, from Kaylee's family before that she was a true crime fan, and this sort of backs that up. She had seen a poster of a missing woman, 62-year-old uh, missing woman from Coeur d'Alene named um, Sharon Archer, um, and, and knew that this woman was missing, apparently thought that she saw uh, Sharon at a Walmart and knew enough to call police. Uh, and was in touch with police in Moscow. Uh, some of the same police officers who would eventually, sadly, be working on, on the homicide investigation involving her. Um, but, but yeah, she, she saw the woman that she thought was missing, and she made the call. So she reported this missing person to some of the same officers that are now working on her murder case. Incredibly sad and strange. I mean, it's weird how, you know, all these connections in small towns, it's very strange. And it turns out that she dealt with an officer um, that is now, I think, the lead or at least one of the lead investigators in, in her murder case. Like the coincidence is just off the chain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, off it, the it chain. Is off I the chain. think she and probably I meant off the charts. I don't know. Or do you think off the chain? Let me know in the comments if you think off the chain was correct or if off the charts would have made more sense. Again, I just I get sad about it because I just think about, again, the fact that she was trying to help someone else. I've heard from her sister. That's the kind of person she was. I mean, she went out of her way to remember the poster and then to call police. Um, and, and of course, then you just think about the way her life tragically ended.
Yeah, no kidding. Well, hopefully they're just as inspired um, by her as her sister is to, to really get justice for her. So the, the, the next thing is the one I think that bothers me the most uh, in this case, and that is that the public defender who was assigned to, to Brian Koberger's case, Ann Taylor, uh, look, she's a really good lawyer, excellent lawyer. She's had great track record, but it turns out she's had at least four cases uh, that she has worked on specifically regarding one of the victims uh, that Brian Koberger is alleged to have murdered, Zana Kernodal. So she has actually worked with Zana Kernodal's mother on four different cases. I don't understand how this happened. So a lot of you sent me this on different kind of tweets, and once it's reported here, it's kind of confirmed, and it wasn't just this recent time where she uh, conflicted off, but multiple times, I think up to four times, that she has already represented Zana Kernodal's mom, which gives you a little look into the past and what may come out and what may become relevant in this case. There's a lot of talk of drugs in this case and in the background of this case, but the fact that Ann Taylor represented Zana Kernodal's mom multiple times in the past, prior to representing her this time, prior to then representing Brian Koberger and then conflicting off the current case she represents Zana Kernodal's mom on. Does that change the way you look at it? Does that think, do you think that now after finding out this information that Ann Taylor should absolutely not be able to represent Brian Koberger? Put your answer in the chat, pause the video, hit the like button, put your answer in the chat. All right. After you have answered the question in the chat or in the comments, I really think that legally speaking, this does not change a thing. These representations were in the past. Again, we're talking about public defenders who represent thousands of people. So if you represent somebody and then somebody connected to them by family, by uh, occupation, by you know social life, whatever it may be, is a victim in a different, totally unrelated case, there's a good chance, especially in a small town, you will still represent the defendant on that case. And if she was conflicted off of every family member and friend and acquaintance and person connected to all of her clients when they become victims in another unrelated case, then the public defender wouldn't be able to represent half of the community here and other small communities as well. And other large ones, right? Where people are even more connected and there's even more crime and more people coming through in some big cities. So oftentimes there's some kind of connection between multiple defendants that public defenders represent especially if the cases are not active at that time and it's prior cases from years in the past. So to me, this doesn't change anything legally, but from lay people and the way that the, the world and the public is looking at this, I think it looks even worse potentially and even more like Ann Taylor shouldn't represent him. But I really don't think this is going to be an issue at all for appeal or an issue that may cause a mistrial or something like that. I don't see any issues like that. And I wouldn't be surprised, and we haven't seen it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ann Taylor was like, listen, I am the public defender. I'm death penalty certified. I'm the gal you want. Sign this conflict waiver just in case there are any conflicts from any of the prior people that I represented. I would ask him to sign that if I was her. And he can absolutely waive any potential conflict that may come up. She doesn't represent Kernodal's mom now. She is uh, substituted off of that case. But that's something that could come into play here as well. A conflict waiver, a knowing waiver. Because if I'm Brian Koberger, I want Ann Taylor representing me, not some conflict counsel or somebody else that's not as competent or qualified as Ann Taylor, who seems to be the most competent and qualified person to represent Brian Koberger and what he's going through and could likely go through talking about a death penalty uh, potential on this case. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, it, it's a, you know, there's not a lot of public defenders. That might be one of the explanations in Idaho, but, but you're right. I mean, the fact that, um, that Ann Taylor, the now public defender for Brian Koberger, was the lawyer for Zana Kernodal's mother, Kara, on her possession of a controlled substance charge. She was Zana's mom's lawyer when Brian was arrested. Uh, and it was on January 5th, the same day that she was put on the Koberger case, that she filed these documents and said, wait a minute, I want to get off of the Kernodal case. Right. And that's exactly when it happened, when she started representing Brian Koberger, which again, to me, there's no real issue on his side or on his case. 
Um, but even if there is potentially one, you can have them sign a conflict waiver. So as more information comes out, we will always break it down for you whenever we have time, connect it to the legal case, give you the legal angles, break down, try to explain stuff in a way that you can understand it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Let me know in the comments if you did. Um, hit that like button if you haven't already and make sure you subscribe for more on this case in the future because it seems like information is coming out nonstop. So thanks so much for being with us. Until next time, I'm out.